I've heard and I've read that this was the first time we ever held meetings in northern New Jersey. That is not true. But you're not old enough to remember when I was last here. I think it was 1944 or 45, I was here for a week at one of the Bible churches of, I think it was in Hawthorne that we were here. I don't think that Cliff or Bev was with me at that time. Bev Shea might have been with me, but I don't think so. He came from New York City, and uh, people can't believe it when I tell, when he tells them that he's 83 years of age, and that's George Beverly Shea. And he sings better now than he did when we were here 34 years ago. We've been reading a great deal about the Soviet Union and what's happening there. And people ask me, do I think that it's more dangerous now than it was a few years ago? Yes, I think it's more dangerous because they're splitting up into different nations or different republics. And all of Europe seems to be in turmoil. In Yugoslavia, they're fighting and killing. And that's where the First World War began, right there, when a Serbian shot and killed the Archduke, and the First World War was on. And many of the wars of history have come from that area. And if ever we needed to pray for peace, it is now. I think peace is very fragile. And I noticed this Mr. Yeltsin announced tonight that he was trying to collect all the atomic bombs that had been built by the Soviet Union during the past years and put them on Russian soil and control them. But he did not give absolute proof that they are controlled. We never know when some loose cannon will grab those and start a war that could destroy civilization. We've just finished the war in, in the Middle East. And now we're talking about other wars that could take place at any time. If ever we needed to pray and work for peace, it's now. Mr. Gorbachev confronting a nation that for 74 years has been officially atheistic. And when one of the deputies asked a difficult question a couple days ago, he replied, I don't have the answer to that question. Only Jesus Christ has the answer. Well, I'd Five weeks ago, I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Gorbachev for about 40 minutes about Jesus Christ. And then the next day, I talked an hour and a quarter with Mr. Yeltsin for about, and we talked about Jesus Christ, in addition to other things that we discussed. Another deputy asked uh, Mr. Gorbachev how he planned to feed so many hungry people. He said, I can't feed the masses. He said, only Jesus Christ could do that. Last week, Time magazine had as its front cover about the Soviet Union and the opening, but the opening article had an interview with the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. George Carey. I went to England to attend his enthronement as he invited me, and he emphasized in that entire article in Time magazine the sovereignty and supremacy of Jesus Christ. He was asked, what does it mean to you to be a Christian? And he replied, it's a personal allegiance to the historical figure of Jesus Christ. He said that many religions point to God, but only one leads to God, and that is Christ. He, he said people who say all religions lead to God are generally the ones who want to avoid any way of getting to God and asked what his greatest objective was for the whole worldwide Episcopal Anglican Church, he said evangelism. He said we must win people to Christ. Tonight I want us to turn to Matthew, the 16th chapter. The 16th chapter and the 15th verse. I'll just take time to read one verse. It's a question that Jesus is asking his disciples. He says, who do people say that I am? 
Who do people say that I am? Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? Why after 2,000 years do millions of people worship him? Why after 2,000 years do more universities and colleges and institutions have their names after him? There are many motion pictures in the past few years made about Jesus Christ. Millions around the world are asking, who is Jesus? Jesus himself asked that question, whom do people say that I am? And this is an important question for every one of you to get a proper answer, because where you are a hundred years from tonight will be, will hang on that question. Who is Jesus Christ? What does the Bible claim about him? The Bible tells us the story of Jesus. The Bible claims, first of all, that he's the creative Christ. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. You mean to tell me that Jesus Christ made this whole universe? Yes. We're told that there are billions of galaxies and they've just discovered a large new galaxy that may be the largest in the whole universe. And then you can look at the world through a microscope and see all the insects and all the bugs and all the other little things that creep and crawl. He made them all. All the living creatures in the sea, including the white shark, he made them. The mountains, the continents, the seas, the heavens, and every moving and living thing, he made it all. In many parts of the world, it's the men of the hard sciences that are coming to Christ. The greatest scientist maybe the world has ever known was Pascal of France. He was the greatest scientist in the 17th century, and it's to him that we owe the calculator. It's to him that he had the beginnings of the computer. He was born in 1623. And on November 23rd, 1654, at the age of 31, he was the greatest scientist in the world, maybe one of the greatest scientists that ever lived, he got on his knees after two hours of prayer and he said to the Lord, I submit myself absolutely to Jesus Christ, my Redeemer. He hadn't found Christ through science, but his logic and his scientific knowledge helped him to realize that there was no answer to what people were searching for except Christ. Jesus was the creative Christ. He created the universe. Then secondly, he's the compassionate Christ. The scripture says he went about doing good. Jesus never met a human need that he did not supply. He made the blind to see and the mute to speak and the deaf to hear. He touched and cleansed the lepers. We are living in a world that hurts. You walk up and down some of the streets in New York City or over here in New Jersey and you see hurting people everywhere. There are tens of thousands of people that hurt in America tonight. And compassion is a word that is often used and misused because we don't know the meaning of the word. The literal meaning of the word compassion means that you suffer with the person. You get involved with the person that's suffering. And that's the reason we have the Love in Action program, to go and help people that are hungry and do something about it. Not just talk about it and preach about it, but do something. And we do it not because we can feed everybody that's hungry in New Jersey or in New York, but we want to set an example for all the churches to help people that are hungry. That's what Jesus did. And compassion is looking at the television screen and seeing those thousands of Kurds. My son has been there several times to take food to the Kurds and to the Iraqis that were suffering and to others. And then in, we just held a, a week of meetings in Moscow. And uh, we had, it was in a stadium uh, that looks a little bit like this. And we had 5,000 clergy of all denominations. They had to be approved by their church to come. And we had what we called a school of evangelism. And it was one of the greatest weeks of my entire life. 
because I saw people drinking in the gospel and we kept them at the University of Moscow in the dormitories and the university fed them and at night some of those people would go out on the lawn and the streets and they would sing the songs that they sang in prison when they were suffering because of their faith in God. Yes, Jesus Christ can bring a song in the midst of suffering and in the midst of hurting. There are those people in South Africa that are suffering. There are those, and this week, by the way, this next week, I'll have an opportunity, I've already made it, a whole half an hour, I'm going to be speaking on South African television. They're going to cut out all the other television and just have that one channel in which I'll have an opportunity to talk on peace and love between the races. And the letter of invitation, the, the invitation was supported by Mr. Mandela, Mr. De Klerk, Chief Belawutsi, and the other leaders in South Africa. And they've asked us to come for crusades. We were there in 1976, and I postponed it 20 years because I said we'll never come and speak to a segregated audience in South Africa. And we went, and the stadiums in Durban and the stadiums in Johannesburg were packed and jammed, and it was about half and half, and we did not allow black people to sit together or white people to sit together. They had to be sprinkled together so that, that it was real integration. And the big headline, we still have the newspapers, the big headline said, Graham says apartheid is sin. And it is a sin. And it's a problem that we need to face. And regardless of the color of our skin, we need to love each other. And we need to bring ourselves together and realize that we are created in the image of God. I didn't ask to be born white. You didn't ask to be born black or brown or whatever color skin you have. You are made in the image of God. God created you, and God has a purpose for you, and he loves you. Whoever you are, he loves you. And yet, we read that crime rose 10% in America last year, and there are many people that are hungry, and many people that are homeless, many people that are suffering from injustice. And often so-called compassion does not reach to actual involvement with those in need. Compassion means that we identify and we contribute when possible to them. And that's the reason we have this love in action. There are physical diseases that Jesus is interested in. He had compassion on the hungry, the leper, the blind man, the people in the hospital in John the fifth chapter. The hospital had five wings to it and on those five wings were scores of people that were suffering from all kinds of diseases and Jesus went to the worst and picked him up and healed him and changed him. There are psychological diseases, the disease of guilt, loneliness, fear, emptiness, fear of death, despair. All of these we read about in our papers and watch on our TV screens every day and they're problems that Jesus Christ could solve if we'll open our hearts to him and surrender to him. Oh yes, most of us here tonight go to church. I would say that most of you are members of a church somewhere. You've been baptized or you've been confirmed or whatever it may mean. But you really haven't surrendered totally to Christ to let him have all of you and surrender your life completely to him and follow him and serve him. Then there's spiritual disease. Nicodemus in the third chapter of John was a, was a religious leader. He was a great theologian. He was a wealthy man. He had great religion. Everybody respected his theological knowledge and respected the fact that he was religious. But when he talked to Jesus, Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born from above. Have you been born from above? That means the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and gives you a new heart and a new direction in your life and you surrender completely to him and he guides you and leads you every day in your everyday problems and your work. I remember we were in Poland, the first time we were in Poland. And uh, when we got off the plane, Bishop uh, Mishewick of the Roman Catholic Church came and grabbed me and hugged me and he said, our churches are open to you. 
And I didn't quite know what he meant, but he meant that the Protestant churches were so small that we're going to open the great cathedrals throughout Poland for us to go and preach the gospel to, which we did. And that was long before we'd ever heard of Mr. Gorbachev. That was way back. And I remember that they gave a wonderful banquet for us that first evening. And I was sitting beside a Monsignor of the Roman Catholic Church, and he said, I'd like to tell you a little story. He said, you know, I took my PhD at the University of Chicago. And while I was studying there, he said, I was riding on a bus, and behind me was sitting a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder. And she said, I beg your pardon, sir. But have you ever been born again? <laughs> he said, uh, he said, well, I'm a priest. And he said, I have uh, been baptized and confirmed. I suppose in a sense I have, but. And then he said he went back to his room at the dormitory and got out the Bible because he remembered that Jesus used that term in the third chapter of John and he turned to it. And he said, I began to read it. I got on my knees and read it over and over again. And I gave my heart to Christ in a new way. I don't know whether that was when I was born again or not. My theology tells me not. But he said, something happened to me that day that has never left me. And I have a peace I never knew before. I asked him if I could tell that story publicly. And he said, yes. And I told it all over Poland. And I think many people came to Christ in Poland because of that story, because they realized that they too liked something. Like Nicodemus, he had religion, but he needed something else. He needed that personal relationship to Christ that he didn't have. Are you sure that you have it? Are you certain that you have been born from above? Today, Jesus Christ motivates all believers to help the starving and the hungry to build hospitals. My father-in-law went to China. He was playing professional baseball and he felt that God had called him into medicine and he stopped his baseball. He'd just been sold to the Baltimore Orioles from the Richmond team. He studied, got his degree, went to China and built a hospital and my wife was born and reared in China. And you can't engage in conversation with her for five minutes on any subject but what she doesn't bring up China. She studies China, she talks about China, she's burdened for China, she weeps over China. And she's been back to China several times, and we went to China just a year before the Tiananmen Square. My wife was at Tiananmen Square with my three daughters just a week before the shooting took place. Jesus wants us to teach people to read and write. That's what Mrs. George Bush does. She's been burdened about that all her life, about people learning to read and write, to counsel the depressed, the suicidal, drug users, people with AIDS, their social responsibilities that no true believer can escape. We should be involved. We ought to be in the front of some of these issues that face us, such as the fight against AIDS. I look on our world of need. Everywhere I look, I see need. We walked up and down some of the streets of New York City last week and we would see people asleep on the sidewalk. We would see people hungry. We would see people in all kinds of conditions. And we traveled throughout and I, my heart bled and it was broken. And I said, what can I do? These problems are too great for me. I feel a helplessness as I look on the world scene today. How can I cope with it? What more can I do? Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. If we turn it over to Christ and trust him and live like we're supposed to live, we could solve these problems. Amen. But you know, when he, left, when he left the scene of this suffering world, he had not healed all the people. Have you ever thought about that? He could have, but he didn't do it. He hadn't fed everybody that was hungry. He said, I have finished the work which my father gave me to do. I finished it. And I feel that way. There's going to come a time when I'm going to finish the work that God has assigned to me as an evangelist. And I'm going to die with a peace and a joy in my heart that I have 
been faithful, tried to be faithful to him. He's not only the creative Christ and the compassionate Christ, but he's the crucified Christ. No one living today can imagine what that scene was 2,000 years ago. On every church, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, we see a cross. On Orthodox Church in the Soviet Union, we see a cross. Every time I've been on a preaching tour of the Soviet Union, which has been four times, I've been with the Orthodox Church. I've been their guest. This last time, for various reasons, we were the guest of what is called the Evangelicals, which means the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, and all the rest. And we had a glorious time at all of them. We saw people coming to Christ by all, from different ones. But death by crucifixion was a lingering death. It took many hours or many days to die. There was the crowd outside of Jerusalem shouting and screaming and scoffing, hurling their insults. They took a crown of thorns and put it on Jesus' brow. They pulled his beard till his face bled. They put a spikes in his hands and a spear in his side and spiked through his feet and hung him on that cross between heaven and earth. And he said this. He said, do you not think that I cannot now pray to my father and he would send me more than 12 legions of angels? 72,000 angels would have come to rescue him. Only one angel killed 185,000 in one of the stories of the Old Testament. He didn't leave the cross. If he'd have left the cross as they wanted him to do, as the people wanted him to do, they said, use your supernatural powers and come down from the cross. And he said, no. He didn't need to stay there. He had never sinned. He died in your place. He took your sin and my sin. All the suffering, shame, disgrace, dishonor, and death that we deserved, he bore for us. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that we're under the sentence of death, physical death and spiritual death. We're going to face the judgment. There is a judgment day coming, and we're going to have to stand face to face with God and give an account of how we lived here and what we did about Christ. But Jesus took it on the cross and shed his blood for us. The scripture says he was made a curse. He was made sin for us. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin. Think of it. Jesus Christ, this pure, this wonderful, the greatest person that ever lived, the holiest person that ever lived, the son of the living God, became sin. He had never known sin. And he became guilty at that moment of adultery. He became guilty of lying, of idolatry. He became guilty of every ugly, dirty thing you can think of because it was your sins poured out on him. And because of the cross, God offers forgiveness, justification, peace, joy, a new nature, eternal life, the Holy Spirit to help you live every day and eternal glory. When you die, you go to heaven and you can know it before you leave here. He's not only the crucified Christ, he's the conquering Christ. He rose from the dead. He didn't stay in the grave. I remember the first time I toured the Soviet Union to preach. I had, uh, I had with me the man that is now the dean of the theological school in Leningrad for the Orthodox Church. And his name is Father Sorokin. And as we were going to the airport, I said to him, I said, Vladimir, I said, you've been hearing me preach all these days and weeks here in your churches. I said, do you have any suggestions? He said, yes. And I listened very carefully because he was a brilliant theologian. He said, emphasize the resurrection more. He said, if Christ is not raised from the dead, the cross has no meaning. And I never forgot that. On the third day, they went to the tomb and an angel was sitting there and said, he is not here, he is risen. Jesus himself said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
And his resurrection is mentioned over a hundred times in the, in the New Testament. Christ is alive, and I'm not preaching to you tonight a dead Christ hanging on a cross. I'm preaching to you a living Christ. And he, he is the one that can come into your heart. And then, fifthly, he's the contemporary Christ. That Christ is living in the world today, and he's changing lives. I think of men like Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, you remember? And how God wonderfully changed him and transformed him. And now he gives his testimony all over and he works among prisoners in various parts of the world. Well, I think about a man in Little Rock, Arkansas. We were talking about him yesterday. When we went to Little Rock two, two years ago, he was one of the roughest, toughest, meanest men in town, I was told. They said he shoved the governor. He was an activist of the first order. He would do anything. He edited a newspaper and he used all kinds of language to describe his feelings. And one night he asked if he could see me. I said, of course, and he came in to see me. And he asked me to pray for him. And I prayed for him. And he received Christ into his heart very much like a little child. And he's now become a person who preaches the gospel absolutely changed and transformed and people that he used to dislike he now loves and he's one of the most popular men in that part of the country to proclaim the gospel and to give his testimony then there's the coming Christ Jesus said I will come again in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh behold he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him the whole world seems to be reaching towards some sort of a climax. I have more people ask me, do I think we're approaching the end of the age? And I tell them that Jesus said that we're not to speculate on the time or the date, nor the hour. But he said you're to look for signs. And if those signs are converging at one point, he said my coming draws nigh. And I have to say, with all honesty, that those signs are now converging. And it seems to me that we're drawing close to that time when Christ is going to come and his kingdom is going to rule. The kingdom of God is going to come and we're going to know peace. Now, what does God require you to do? God gave his son, Jesus Christ, because he loved you. God's interested in you. He has every hair of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. First, you must do two or three things. First, you must repent of your sins. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was, repent ye. The apostle Peter said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out. What does repentance mean? Repentance means that you come to God and say, God, I'm sorry I've sinned. I've sinned against you. I've broken your laws. And sin means that you have broken the Ten Commandments. And if you break one of those Ten Commandments, you've broken them all. If you've ever told a lie, you've broken all the Ten Commandments. If you've ever had lust in your heart, you've broken all the Ten Commandments. And we're all guilty. Every one of us, everyone that's ever been born is guilty, except Jesus himself. And then the scripture says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. God commands you to repent. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? It means that you not only say, God, I'm sorry. It means that you ask him to help you to turn from your sins, to change your way of living, to get rid of those old habits you shouldn't have. And he'll help you to get rid of them. But you have to ask him to do it. And then you must come by faith. By, without faith, it's impossible to please him. The word faith means that you totally trust. When I stepped on this platform tonight, I'd never been on it before. But I had faith to believe it would hold a person. It was built to hold a man. The scripture says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The scripture says in Romans 4, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I have to have righteousness to get into heaven, and I don't have any. Billy Graham is a sinner. 
I don't have any righteousness of my own. I come in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting totally and fully in him. Then the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you can work your way to heaven, you'd get up to heaven and boast to everybody. Look what I did. I was such a good person. I got here on my own. You get there totally because of Christ. Now, what does that mean? That means that tonight, on this night, the Bible says, now is the accepted time. Today is the sal day of salvation. I don't believe that anyone is here by accident tonight. I think you're here in the providence of God. Somebody brought you. Somebody prayed for you to be here. Or you just came on your own. But you've never really totally complete, committed yourself to Christ. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of the church. You might have been baptized and, or you might not have been. You may be confirmed. But you need to make sure of your relationship to Christ. 